A study of the book Reversing Hermon, an overview of session 3, Viap Kalu. Learning Objectives At the end of this session, we shall know why Genesis 6 includes verses 1 through 4 about angels, giants, and a flood. Identify the Apkalu with the biblical watchers and contrast Genesis 6 with Mesopotamian mythology. Just as we have modern myths, so Israelites used to listen to pagan myths all the time. So, did the Hebrew Bible writers borrow from those creation, angel, and flood myths? Did they make up their own similar myths? Or did they have some other reason for including Genesis 6, 1 through 4 in their scriptures? Apkalu Origins and Depictions According to Mesopotamian mythology, the Apkalu were created in the river, that is, the primeval deep, the Apsu or Abyss, in the underworld. As such, they are sometimes depicted as fishmen. They were responsible to the gods for the right functioning of heaven and earth. Thus, they had access to the gods in heaven. As such, they are sometimes depicted as birdmen. Ancient clay tablets reveal several pre-Diluvian Mesopotamian king lists, pre-Diluvian meaning before the flood. One of these lists seven pre-Diluvian kings. Alulim, who reigned for 28,800 years, assisted by an Apkalu named Uanna. Alalgar, 36,000 years, assisted by an Apkalu. Enmenluana, 43,200 years. And Mengalana, 28,800 years. Dumuzi, 36,000 years. And Espinadizana, Ensipadzidana, 13,800 years. And seventhly, Ubaratutu, who reigned 18,600 years, assisted by an Apkalo named Utubzu. Some of these tablets also contain descriptions of each of these Apkalu. Uana is said to be the one who finished the plans for heaven and earth. Uenaduga, who was endowed with comprehensive intelligence. Enmeduga, who was allotted a good fate. Enmegalama, who was born in a house. Enmegbeluga, who grew up on pasture land. Enenilda, the conjurer or magician of the city of Eridu, and the seventh of these great kings was assisted by the Apkalu Utuabzu, quote, who ascended into heaven, unquote. Of whom does this remind you in the Bible? There were Apkalu before the flood and afterwards. The pre-flood Apkalu correspond to the biblical watchers. They were divine beings, having access to the gods, and received knowledge for human society. The Apkalu after the flood correspond to the Nephilim. Four of them are named in clay tablets, being part divine, part human, being the human sages or wise men. The seventh of these reminds us of the biblical Enoch in Genesis chapter 5, where we read, When Enoch had lived sixty-five years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah three hundred years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty-five years. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. He was not, God took him whither. In Hebrews chapter 11, we read further, By faith Enoch was taken up, so that he should not see death, 
and he was not found, because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God, and without faith it is impossible to please him. And in the epistle of Jude, it was also about these evil men that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the godly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed. Let's try to summarize the parallels between the Bible and Mesopotamian literature. In the Bible, the single great deity is Yahweh, the Lord. Enoch was the seventh generation from Adam. Enoch walked with God. God took him up to heaven. After this, the divine watchers committed sin. Whereas in Mesopotamia, the great god Marduk is accompanied by other gods. And Meduranki is the seventh antediluvian king corresponding to Enoch. The Anunnaki learned from the gods by ascending into heaven. Thus the divine Apkalu have wisdom from the gods. Back to the Bible, the watchers mated with the watchers mated with women. They fathered Nephilim giants. The Nephilim proved violent and so perished in the flood, whereas the sinning watchers are confined in hell. In Mesopotamia, the Apkalu mated with human women. They also fathered part human kings. The good Apkalu remained wise, teaching the survivors from the flood. Ever since, scribes have been transmitting their divine wisdom. Now, what was this secret knowledge? Well, we learn from cuneiform texts about the Mesopotamian Apkalu. It is they who make and keep a nation great. They do so through divination and horoscopy, stargazing. They apply their knowledge to advancing technology and handicraft. Whereas the biblical watchers, according to First Enoch, chapters 8 and 10, taught human beings to make instruments of war, and to the women they taught seductive cosmetology, and to all humans, sorcery and the casting of spells, all evil. Now we refer to the book of Ezekiel. In the 5th century BC, Ezekiel was visiting Jewish settlements near the Chebar Canal, a branch of the Euphrates River. He wrote, I was amongst the exiles by the Chebar Canal, Babylonia. The heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God addressing the evil one. You were in Eden, the garden of God, an anointed guardian cherub. Satan was a watcher. I cast you as a profane thing from the mountain of God and from all the trees of Eden. What is the importance of trees in Eden besides the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Well, the watchers had many duties to perform in Eden and before the flood and afterwards. Before they sinned, the watchers ascended onto earth, according to Jubilees chapter 4, and they instructed humans to judge righteously. In the Dead Sea Scrolls 4Q530, we learned that they worked as tree gardeners, whereas according to Mesopotamian texts, their only sin was to cohabit with human women, whilst their knowledge lived on among humans through their hybrid offspring, the Apkalu. Thus the Apkalu were the giants, the men of renown. Genesis 6, 4 reminds us, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Whereas in Mesopotamia, we learn that the fourth post-flood Apkalu was described as being 
two-thirds op kalu. In cuneiform texts titled Bit Mesri, we learn that Noah was not a Hebrew counterpart to Gilgamesh. For according to the Bible, Noah was a righteous pre-flood human being, a man, whereas Gilgamesh was said to be a post-flood apkalu, two-thirds divine, one-third human, of gigantic stature being eleven cubits, eighteen feet or four meters tall, and served as a bearer of a pre-flood message. In the Jewish Book of Giants, from the Dead Sea Scroll 4Q531, Gilgamesh himself admits that he is weaker than the heavenly beings. One Mesopotamian text equates the Apkalu with the Watchers. The pagans said that the Apkalu could be good or evil. Jewish literature said that the Watchers could be good or evil. Mesopotamian text KAR 298 from the ancient city of Asur prescribes the making of Apkalu figurines, quoting from another text, Atunu Tsalme Apkale Matsare, meaning, You are the Apkalu figures, the watchers. The Akkadian verb Eru, to be awake, is similar to the Aramaic verb Ir, to guard, and to the Hebrew Awir, to be awake. By way of summary, the Mesopotamian myth proved that all elements of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, correspond to ancient myths about the flood. These parallels are preserved in the Second Temple Jewish book, First Enoch. Other non-biblical details found in First Enoch are consistent with Genesis 6. Thus Jude and Peter rightly incorporated First Enoch in their own theological thinking. By way of conclusion, then, we asked at the beginning, why did Genesis include chapter 6, verses 1 through 4? We can now assert that they sought to challenge Babylonian superiority over other nations by showing that Mesopotamian Apkalu were really evil watchers and giants who corrupted human beings, thus serving as a polemic argument for the superiority of Yahweh over Marduk and explaining the terrible human condition caused by the watchers. As you approach the next section of the book, ask yourself, how will Jesus the Messiah undo the effects of Satan's deceit? How will he secure forgiveness for human sins and solve the problem of human death? Can he keep humans from total depravity? Help Christians to live righteously? How will he get rid of the evil spirits who still deceive governments and nations? Will he be able to reverse Hermon worldwide? Thank you.